Hello there, beloved of the Lord. It's your brother Joe Amato again. Welcome you back to my channel, Pour Out Your Spirit, with a very special message today entitled, God as He Is. Hebrews 11.6 teaches us that without faith, it is impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. God is... That means that God exists, and God is who He is. Malachi 3 6 teaches us that God does not change. Why would He ever need to change when He is perfect? Deuteronomy 32 4 proclaims, He is the rock, His work is perfect, for all His ways are justice, a God of truth and without injustice. Righteous and upright is he, praise the Lord. And Psalm 1830, as well as 2 Samuel 22:31, say the same thing, confirming this, saying, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. Praise the Lord. Again, I say, praise the Lord. God even remained perfect when he took on humanity. In the person of Jesus Christ, God the Father's only begotten Son, part of the Trinity. Hebrews 4 verse 15 said of Jesus, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Thank God. So, to review, as we approach God at the most basic level, we must understand these three things. One, that God exists. He is indeed there. Two, that He rewards those who seek Him diligently. And three, He is perfect. Many people are fine with that, these three things, on the surface. At least they would be willing to entertain these truths. But the conflict comes in when they have to admit that God is the same God who, as John 3.16 says, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son as the very same God who Hebrews 10.31 asserts, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. He is the one who Paul proclaimed in Colossians 1.16 whom by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Yet God is the same one who Genesis nineteen twenty four and 25 tells us rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah, out of the heavens, so overthrowing those cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. He is the God who delivered three bound Hebrew boys from a fiery furnace by joining with them in that fire, but they came out unburned, unhurt, loosed, not even a hair on their heads singed, and their clothing intact, and not even smelling of smoke. Yet this same God drowned the Egyptian Pharaoh, all his chariots and horsemen, and that whole army in the midst of the Red Sea that he had just delivered his people out of. In these descriptions, I've given you moments of extreme mercy, grace, love, salvation, and protection, but also other occasions of immense judgment, wrath, and vengeance. Some have trouble rectifying this. They may conclude, how could a loving God send people to hell? Or how could he allow pain and suffering in this world? I think it helps to explain that they should see God as the role by which he chose to be known by, which is, he is the Father. People must see him as the only parent over all of creation. I love that this is the way in which he wants to relate with you and me. 
He could have been creator alone who rules as Beth Midler once sang, only watching us from a distance. He could have been a great overlord, giving us no freedom of will and instead programming us all as dutiful robots or slaves. God could have chosen any method by which to relate with humanity, that's you and me, but again, he wants to be our Heavenly Father, our Abba, our Daddy. In the natural world, think about the importance of a good, balanced father. Consider the product of a father that is imbalanced. An imbalance on one side, being too authoritative, produces fear-ridden, bound, broken children. An imbalance on the other side, being too permissive, produces spoiled, vile ingrates, many of whom walk this earth today. So, okay, perhaps I'm able to persuade several of you to some degree with these points. Still many question the harshness of an eternal separation and torment of hell. The reason for hell is at least twofold for two main reasons. It is to preserve the holiness of heaven and it is to satisfy the wrath of God against sin. Let's first consider the holiness of God. Picture, if you will, a white room. White not in color, but in purity, in light, in perfection magnified. If that which is impure enters such a room, if any bit of darkness or shadow sneaks in, if wrongdoing somehow gets in, these things are out of place. More so, they become offensive, and worst of all, they pollute this once pristine environment. We can return to the question which has been phrased incorrectly as why does God allow pain and suffering on the earth? Instead we should be clear that all pain and suffering are directly or indirectly a result of sin. Sin as we first learned in the Garden of Eden was a departure from the holiness of God. God created the first man, Adam, and the first woman, Eve, to be holy and sinless. Before sin, they walked naked and unashamed on the earth. They enjoyed a bountiful planet and a dear relationship with their loving Creator. Sin's immediate effect was exile from their abundant garden home. Thorn and thistle instead. The promise of pain in childbirth the shame of their nakedness needing to be covered, and worst of all, a schism in their relationship with God who created them. As sin and its effects have worked its way down through the generations until today, we should understand why our world just seems to be growing more wicked, more cold, and darker still. Sin cannot stand in the presence of God, who is holy. God must judge sin in order for him to remain righteous. What do you think of a judge who releases every criminal back into society? You may be a person who leans toward mercy, as I do, but let me ask you this. Would you feel at peace if you learned that your neighbor to your left was a rapist and the one on your right was a murderer and right across the street from you lived a thief who is at this moment making notes of your comings and goings to plan his next hit? Guess where? Right at your house. Thank God that he is balanced in his mercy and his judgment. Actually, I would argue that God also leans more toward mercy. Numbers 14.18 tells us the Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he by no means clears the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. God will judge all those who choose to remain in their own guilt but he has provided a way for all of us to be made righteous and holy. 
even as Adam and Eve once were. That way came through the sacrifice of Jesus. Yeshua is as he was called in the Hebrew, which means Savior. Romans 5, 8 through 9 makes this clear, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than, this is verse 9, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. The time of wrath will soon be upon the unrepentant of humanity. It's coming, beloved. Paul said to these in Romans 2, 5, But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent hearts, you are treasuring up for yourselves wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. And John 3, 36, in that verse, Jesus said of himself, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, but he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. That's the double-edged sword of the gospel. It is life for those who humbly repent and receive Christ as Savior and Lord. It is eternal hell and torment for the prideful who reject him. How foolish to reject this amazing grace of God, which came at the ultimate cost, even the suffering and death of his own dear son, Jesus, the darling of heaven. Isaiah prophesied this hundreds of years before. Jesus came, right, rather, that he prophesied it hundreds of years before Jesus came to fulfill it, as it is written in Isaiah 53, 4 through 6. Surely he, Jesus, has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Verse 5, But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Verse 6, All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. So God will judge, but he has graciously provided one way for each of us to escape his coming judgment. Praise the Lord. For people who question the times where God in the Bible says things that they perceive to be difficult to receive, or does things that they might believe is harsh or unkind in their modern view remember some of the things that jesus even said and did as recorded in the gospels i highlight them in a video in this channel titled jesus wasn't always nice it's actually i think my most viewed video several instances that i spoke of in this video were when Mary, his mother, asked him to help with the wine problem at the wedding in Cana, and his first response was, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Jesus also put out the mourners when Jairus' daughter died. Some would think that's cruel. What is he doing? Telling these people who are mourning, mourning for the loss of this child they can't mourn? Of course, he had a reason, but he put them out of the house. How about when Jesus found money changers and people selling oxen and sheep and doves in the temple? Remember, he had made a whip of cords, and with it he drove them out and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables? And he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered it was written, Zeal for your house has eaten me up. Some other translations say consumed me. Also, when Jesus called out those wicked religious leaders who were in his words hypocrites, and this he said publicly, an evil and adulterous generation, blind guides, fools and blind, he said that their converts become twice the sons of hell as they are. He called them whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. He said that they carried their father's guilt for murdering the prophets, 
They were serpents, in fact a brood of vipers, that will not escape the condemnation of hell, and that the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah would come upon their generation. Then when Peter was used of Satan to suggest that Jesus would not fulfill his mission and go to the cross, Jesus looked right past Peter to the devil who uttered those words through his lips and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. In all these examples, many do not perceive Jesus as being very nice or godly or holy. Jesus was not being unkind in these examples just for the purpose of being unkind. Neither was he stirring up trouble in order to be noticed. Rather, Jesus was asserting the importance of seeking God the Father's will above all other fleshly pursuits and all the other nonsense that sometimes we falsely focus on. Cutting through lies, falsehoods, and hypocrisy which kept the people from a real relationship with his Heavenly Father. That was his goal, to get them back into right relationship with his holy heavenly father. Jesus rebuked even the wayward leaders so that the simplest believers, even children, understood that what God says is wrong is wrong, even if those in leadership positions were doing wrongly and speaking wrongly. He also rebuked the Pharisees and Sadducees to remind all that God hates sin and its effects on all of us. Jesus and the heavenly father desired that the temple remained holy not just a common marketplace and he wants the same for us as well who we he called in the word his temples he wants us also to be made and kept holy by his holy spirit yes jesus was always sinless always wise always very compassionate however jesus didn't always say and do what we might say are nice things or kind things or even socially acceptable things. He was always completely obedient to his father as well. He always said what needed to be said, and he did what needed to be done, and so should it be with we who are his disciples. If your testimony as a believer is that you are always nice, then this speaks to an incomplete one-sided witness. Where is your correction to sinners? and condemnation to outright sin. Are you standing against the voices pulling at you or putting obligation above your obedient service to God? Is your life different enough to cause friction with the unsaved people around you, those in your family and those in your community, those at your job perhaps? Sometimes niceness is not in order, rather bold correction is called for in time. When we rebuke, as led by the Holy Spirit, a rebuke in love can turn a person and their situation around and get them into the right place where they need to be with the Lord. So it is a ministry of love. A little tough, but it's tough love. Are you ready to do all that when God requires you to do it? People around you need to be told that there is only one way for a restored relationship with God the Father and an eternity in heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ alone. Romans 10, 14 through 15 asks the question, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Verse 15, And how shall they preach unless they are sent. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Will you, my beloved, be one of those with beautiful feet who bring the gospel around to those in your sphere of influence? People around you need to be made aware of those things that they are participating in that God defines as sin. Would you be so bold as to warn them? Will you, O oh Christian, make known to those you love and your neighbors their way out of the bondage of sin? People need to be made aware that the window for repentance, the opportunity to repent, 
is more and more close to closing with each passing day. Consider this, laying aside the fact that Jesus' rapture return might occur at any time, most of us who are 40 or older don't have another 50 years remaining to our life. I wore a shirt the other day that had the words written on it, Forgiveness and Redemption, this offer expires when you do. Are you ready to be used of God to rescue as many souls from damnation through your witness, your ministry actions, and your words, and the way you live your life? Throughout this message, we've looked at the things that God the Father and Jesus have said and done that are perceived as troublesome, especially to those who remain in their sin. So I'm letting you in on a little secret, beloved. The ones that have the most issue with the God of the Bible are the ones that are disobeying Him and are fine with their life. God is who He is. He makes no apologies and neither do I for Him. When one is perfect and right, they need not apologize. But God is also so merciful, even when He doesn't have to be. He is unbelievably patient. And I often say to my wife and to other friends around me that I have to admit God is so much more patient than I am. Even with myself, I say, God, I don't know how you can keep forgiving me. But he is so patient and so merciful. The Lord desires to forgive. He did so even at the cost of his own son's suffering at Calvary. He is perfect light without any shadows. James said he is the father of lights who has given every good gift and every perfect gift. In him there is no variation or shadow of turning. There's never a moment where God, who is good, says, let me be a little evil to this one because they got on my nerves or let me, or let me hold back my grace. If anyone comes humbly to him and repents, he receives us no matter what we've done, no matter what we've said. Thank you, Lord. God is the almighty creator of heaven and earth. He does not lie as men do. There is no deceit found in him. God is good and worthy of trust. He is a refuge. He is a shield. He is a high tower to those who trust in him. He is a God of justice. He is love, and he is the lover of your soul. He is the first and the last. He's the beginning and the end. He's the only true God. He is holy. Heaven is his throne, and earth is his footstool. Praise the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So again, God is perfect. Because he is perfect, this makes your and my relationship with him easy unless we choose to complicate it since he is always right if there's a problem then it must be with me or in your relationship with him it must be with you God didn't need saving we did beloved he did the work of getting my salvation done that's why when Jesus hung on the cross he said it is finished the only thing left for me to do was believe and receive it. Receive him as my Lord and Savior. Amen? And you must do the same if you have not, beloved. He promised never to leave or forsake me. So if I feel distant from him, then guess who moved away? It was me or you that moved away. God has never sinned against us. It's we who fall back into sin at times. Therefore, he doesn't need to repent. I do, or you do, beloved. In 1 John 2, verse 1, the apostle told us, My little children, these things I write to you, so that you may not sin. So we have the scripture, we have the word of God to help us not to sin. He says, rather, David had said in the Psalms, Lord, I have hidden my, your word in my heart, so that I might not sin against you. But it says, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of his Father till it's his time to come back and get those who trust him. 
take us away in the rapture. He is sitting there interceding for each one of you who have called upon his name. Beloved, but don't live in sin anymore. But we sometimes fall into sin. Don't get hung up in condemnation. That's what Satan wants. Repent and move on quickly with the Holy Spirit of Jesus, who is your sanctifier. Romans 8.1 reminds us there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk in the flesh, but according to the Spirit. We serve a wonderful Lord and Savior. I'm so glad God is who He is. Therefore I worship and I serve Him for who He is, just as He is. Amen. To conclude today, I want to take a moment to check if any of you have not yet received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Perhaps the Holy Spirit has been working on your heart as you've been listening to this message. Maybe you're the kind of person who has asked these questions before. How can a loving God send people to hell? Why does the Bible say that vengeance belongs to Him? Or perhaps other things that you've heard in the Bible that have caused you to question God's kindness or to compare Him with socially acceptable norms in our modern society. I hope this message has enlightened your understanding to who God truly is. And to you, God says the words of Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord, though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Also understand the words of 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he, God the Father, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him, in Christ Jesus. Finally, Romans 10, 8 through 13, tells us how to get saved by God. It reads, But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preached. Verse 9, That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Verse 10, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Verse 11, for the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. That wrath of God is taken right off you if you trust in Jesus. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, and some versions say Jew or Gentile, that means that Jesus was the promised Messiah of the Jews. But the blessing of Abraham was to be blessed, to be a blessing to the whole earth, to the ends of the earth. So as much as Jesus came through the Jewish family, he is bringing to himself children from all walks of life. It doesn't matter what you are, what your religion once was, what your ethnicity is, your race whatever struggles you've gone through it is he has come for all there is no distinction in God's mind between the Jew or the Greek or the Gentile for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him you have to call upon him to be saved for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved and that's verse 13 let's pray beloved Dear Lord, we come to you now in Jesus' name, and I pray that if anybody feels to pray along, Lord God, let them pray and receive you now as their Lord and Savior. Just say these words with me if you want to do that today. Dear Lord, thank you, Lord, my Creator, you who created me in my mother's womb. We thank you for the miracle of life and how you caused me to come to be. You thought that the world needed one of me. I thank you, Lord, for my life. And I thank you for what Jesus did to save me, to save me from the wrath that's coming from you, a wrath that we all deserve. 
For as the Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short of your glory. I know that just looking around, the people that have hurt me, the people that I've hurt, I, I confess all my sins to you now, Lord. I'm sorry for all the things that I've done and that I've said that, is, that have displeased you. Those things that made me worthy of hell. But you took your best. You took your only son, Jesus, and you sacrificed him for me so that I might be brought into your family. Jesus, I receive you now as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for forgiving me of all my sins. Thank you for cleansing me from all unrighteousness. And thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit to come and live within me and stand beside me to sanctify me and prepare me for heaven. Give me the strength through your Spirit to live for you, to seek to do your will instead of just what I want to do. And I receive you now and I thank you for this, Lord, in Jesus' holy name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. If you receive the Lord today, you are born again. You're a new creation created in Christ. Your old life is dead and gone. It's time to live new, to read your Bible and study it, to pray, to find a good church, to worship with other believers, and to learn about your new Christian faith and your walk with God. Please like, share, and subscribe. Really would appreciate it. If you, I'm going to give you a little challenge. Let someone you love see this channel and ask them to watch a video, maybe this one, and to please subscribe. Let's get this message of the gospel out in these last days as far and wide as we can get it. All right? The Lord loves you so much, more than words could ever say. And in his love, I love you as well. God bless you, and I'll see you real soon. Bye-bye.